Hello, everyone. We'll start in just a moment. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Cheryl Aerosmith from the University of Toronto and I'd like to welcome you to our monthly webinar for the initiative called Target 2035. Um, so uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're, you're calling, you're tuning in from. Um, today's uh, topic is, um, is uh, GPCRs and for the um, Asia Pacific um, audience. And our host is uh, Jonathan Vale uh, from Monash University. He's a, a professor of medicinal chemistry at the Monash Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences. He's director of the Australian Translational Medicinal Chemistry F Facility. And he's a chief investigator at the ARC Center for Fragment-Based Design. His uh, interests, uh, research interests are in the design and and quality of HTS libraries, medicinal chemistry, it to lead optimization for the treatment of various diseases, um, especially malaria, neglected diseases. And um, he's also worked in epigenetics area from which I know him. Um, you may also know him for his um, uh, promotion of awareness and good practices around um, avoiding uh, pains and nuisance compounds and screening and cellular assays. And, He's very involved in the overall chemical biology and drug discovery community. So um, Jonathan, thank you for hosting and I turn platform over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. So as, as Cheryl said, so I'm a medicinal chemist and yet you look at the, uh, the, the schedule today and it's relatively bi uh, biological in focus. And you might say, well, target 2035, is this not all about chemistry and probes? But obviously, probes aren't anything without knowledge of the biology. So it's entirely fitting, I think, that we have a focus on, um, on, on receptors and biology. And in this particular case, it's on, on the GPCRs. Now, what we really would encourage is please write your uh, questions as we go along in the Q&A box. You can also use the, the, the chat, I understand, but it's really the Q&A box, which is you use for the, um, for the questions and, and please, don't, please don't be shy on that account. I should just say also that you'll see that we are recording and I just need to make sure that you are all aware that um, you have consented to be recorded. So uh, without further uh, ado, um, I will introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Ka Young Chung. And um, so I assume, Cheryl, you're not going to say anything about Target 2035 right now, or that comes at the end? Um, I wasn't going to talk about 20, Target 2035 itself. There are um, the previous webinars and the introductory one are all on the um, Target 2035 website. So um, www.target2035.net. Okay, that's fine. So, so I'm very pleased to introduce um, Dr. Kai Young Chung. She is an associate professor in the School of Pharmacy at Sung Kian Kwan University in Seoul and heads the Molecular and Structural Biology Lab. Uh, her lab uses HTXMS to, to study protein structure, protein small molecule interactions, protein DNA interactions, protein conformational change in protein folding. And her team, uh, uh, with her at the lead, are specifically interested in understanding conformational dynamics of membrane proteins, such as GPCRs, as well as ion channels and transporters. And so in that context, um, I really welcome her to uh, give her talk on scaffolding mechanism of a RESTIN-2 for ERK signaling cascade. Uh, thank you, Ka Young. Thank you, Jonathan, for the nice introduction. And thank you for the organizers for having me here to present my recent work to the Target 2035 audience. So I will share my screen now. So 
Is it okay? It's yeah. good. Okay. So uh, today I will give a talk titled um, Scaffolding Mechanism of Arresting 2 for Arc Signaling Cascade. But I will not just focus on arresting mediated arc signaling, but I will also discuss arresting mediated junk signaling. So I will give you a brief background about GPCR and arresting and, and, and mechanisms. Uh, maybe most of you already know about this, I will, but I will start with it anyway to be in the same page. Um, so GP shares, as the name implies, it interacts with the G proteins upon agonist mediated activation of the receptor. Um, with the, the G protein uh, mediated pathway, there are series of downstream signaling pathway activation, such as adenyl cyclase activation. The GP shares also interact with orestin when it is phosphorated by GRK. And the orestin uh, induces desensitization or internalization of the receptor. At the same time, orestin can also induce other rounds of signaling pathways such as mechanase activation or SARC activation. So therefore, from one receptor, there are at least two different cellular effect. For example, if you activate opioid receptor, the G protein mediated signaling will give you an analgesic effect. However, if the opioid receptor activates arrestin mediated signaling, then you will get respiratory depression. Therefore, it is important to uh, develop uh, opioid receptor regulator that activate G protein signaling without affecting arresting signaling. We'll call this signaling selective regulator as a biased ligand. And to understand, to, to develop the biased ligand, it's very important to understand the molecular, precise molecular mechanism of how GP shares activate different downstream signaling uh, ca cascade. And today I will focus on how orestins activate mechanisms. So it has been, it has been uh, suggested that orestins can recruit ARC or junk to, to orestin. And it also recruit the upstream kinase of the ARC, MEK, and its upstream kinase, uh, RAF. So orestins recruit the ARC mechanism signaling component or three signaling component in one place. At the same time, orestin also recruit junk and its upstream kinase MKK4 or MKK7 and their upstream kinase ASK. So recruiting three uh, mechanisms component, the, ca the cascade component in one position, orestins facilitate the activation of ARC or junk. And depending on which mechanism cascade um, components are recruited, we will have different effect. So my research goal is to define the binding interface of orestin junk interaction and orestin arc interaction to provide a target site for selective regu regulation of orestin junk or orestin arc signaling. So before I jump into this topic, I would give we, uh, you a um, background about arresting structure and mechanism structure. This is a major uh, state arresting structure. Arestin has N domain and C domain, and most of it are composed of beta strand. And the basal state of arestin is stabilized by two factors, mostly by two factors. One is interaction, polar interaction between the two domains, which is called polar core. And the other is interaction of the C-terminal tail to the end domain. And this interaction of C-terminal tail to the end domain is very important to stabilize the basal state. Upon activation of arresting by binding of phosphorated receptor, the phosphorated receptor part locate, interact at the end domain where the C tail of arrestin was originally localized. So this interaction releases the C tail. So C terminal tail release is the 
critical uh, structure or, or a structure uh, feature that of, of the activated arresting. And we can also detect that the polar core between the two domains are disrupted. And there is a loop rearrangement where, where the receptor interact. And we also detect the relative orientation between N and C domains changes and, and there is a domain rotation. And I will move on to the mechanist structure. This is the mechanist structure and mechanist shares the typical kinase structure. It has N lobe and C lobe and ATP interact between these two lobes. The mechanics also have activation lip or activation segment here, and it has a phosphorylation site. So when, when the mechanics is phosphorylated in this activation loop, activation lip, then, the, then this activation lip undergoes conformational change and change in the position, which make the mechanics activated. And I will discuss about this later. So with that, I would like to start how orestin interact with junk. To answer this question, uh, uh, our lab uses a technique called hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry, HDXMS. Uh, HDXMS uses the phenomena that the peptide amide hydrogen undergoes switching with uh, hydrogen in in hydrogen in the water of the solvent. So if we prepare solvent with deuterated water, then this hydrogen, amide hydrogen will be exchanged to deuterium. And because deuterium is one dalton heavier than hydrogen, we can detect which region of the protein is exchanged by using mass spectrometer. The exchange rate is affected by the conformation of the protein. The, the regions that are exposed to the buffer will be exchanged faster than the regions that are excluded from the buffer. So if we want to monitor the binding interface between two proteins, we can compare the HDX rate before and after complex formation. The binding interface will show reduced HDX upon complex formation because the binding interface is protected from the solvent. The HDX rate is also affected by the, the structure dynamics of the protein. So for example, if you have alpha helix or vera strand, vera sheet, then this amide hydrogen forms hydrogen bond with the, uh, with the neighboring oxygen. And this hydrogen that, that, that is forming hydrogen bond is protected from the solvent. So in this hypothetical protein, the exchange rate is fast in the regions that are flexible and exposed to the buffer, followed by regions that are exposed to the buffer and have some kind of secondary structure. And the regions that are excluded the buffer and have a stable secondary structure will undergo um, slowest uh, exchange. So using this technique, we want to compare the HDX rate before and after co-incubation of junk 3 or arrestin. And, um, and, and we observed that we have uh, the junk 3 undergoes reduced HDX in these regions colored blue upon co-incubation with arrestin. However, we did not any, any HDX changes on arrestin in this condition. Here we used Bayer state of arrestin. So we assumed that arrestin may, be, uh, may need to be activated to interact with junk. So we generated an arrestin construct that mimics the activation status. So as I mentioned before, the arrestin <clears throat> Orestin is in a beta state, and the beta state is stabilized by the, by the polar core or the interaction of the C tail at the end terminus. So to mimic, to make the construct that mimics the active status of orestin, 
we can either disrupt the polar, polar core or truncate the sitemer tail. So here we used arresting construct that the sitemer tail is deleted. And we call it as a preactive arresting. So when you coactivated junk three with preactive arresting, and when we compared the HDX profiles before and after coincubation, now we have, now we, uh, we've got these uh, HDX profile changes. The regions colored with blue should reduce the HDX upon uh, coincubation. Regions colored with, with red are, uh, are the regions that uh, have increased HDX upon coincubation. And green, here is the one that we truncated. So um, as I mentioned before, the HDX rate change can tell us conformational change or the binding interfaces of between two proteins. So the, the, the binding interfaces will be protected after complex formation. So the, the regions that colored with blue are the binding interface candidate. However, as you see here, that is too broad. So we hypothesized that some of these blue colored regions are rear binding interface and some are just um, uh, uh, shows the allosteric conformation or change upon complex formation. So to, the, so to specify the binding interface, we generated three different peptide from orestin based on the HDXMS result peptide one, two, and three. And we co-incubated this peptide with junk three. When we co-incubated uh, peptide two or three with junk three and analyzed the HDX profile changes, we did not detect any HDX profile changes before and after uh, co-incubation. However, when we co-incubate, when we co-incubated peptide one with junk, we now see HDX profile changes like this. What was interesting is that this HDX profile change on junk upon coincubation of arrest, uh, arrestin peptide one was almost the same with the uh, with the, with what we observed with the junk three coincubated with preactive arrestin. So this data suggests that peptide one is the major binding site. And we also want to note that peptide one is only exposed when this C terminal tail of orestin is deleted. So it makes sense that we did not detect a lot of HDX changes when we used major state of orestin. However, we detected uh, HDX changes when the C terminal is deleted so that peptide one is exposed to interact with junk three. To specify which region of junk three is the binding site for the peptide one region of, 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 of arresting, we adapted distance mapping technique using fluorescence quenching effect. So some kind of fluorescence intensity can be affected by the neighboring residues. And if, the, if these fluorescence molecules are located near near the uh, residues containing aromatic side chains, the intensity decreases. And tryptophan has the biggest effect. So here, if the fluorescence is located far from the quenching residue, then it will have uh, a full intensity. However, if the fluorescence is located near the uh, quenching residues, then the intensity will decrease. So we, labeled orestin with fluorescence at within the peptide one region, the serine 13. And we generated junk three, that's a few regions, a few residues are switched to tryptophan. Uh, and we chose these three residues based on the uh, uh, HDXMS result. And we, when we incubated fluorescence labeled arrestin with this junk three mutant, we have seen the intensity 
decreasing only when when the arrestin was incubated with um, junk that has tryptophan at 218 or 223. So this research suggested that serine 13 within the peptide one is facing to these two residues. Uh, interestingly, these residues are located within the activation lip. And as I mentioned before, the activation lip undergoes conformational change after phosphorylation. So this is before phosphorylation and this is after phosphorylation. So in the non-phosphorylated structure, this activation lip tends to be uh, facing the seal lobe of, of the MET kinase. And upon phosphorylation, the activation lip undergoes conformation, conformation or change like this. So I thought that the um, serine 13 is actually facing the C lobe, not the end lobe in, in this case. And we also uh, uh, did some literature search and found that mechanisms have two docking sites. One is this site and the other is F site that interact with other proteins. And uh, there is a, a crystal structure that Junk1 interact with MKP7, which interact with the F site of Junk1. And another group analyzed the HDX changes upon uh, Junk1 and MKP7 complex formation. And they've got this kind of result. And the, they, they have noticed that these regions undergo um, reduced HDX upon co-incubation of Junk1 and MKP7. And this change was similar to what we observed with our Junk3 and arresting co-incubation. Therefore, we suggest that arresting peptide 1 region interact F site of the, of the Junk3. And this interaction occurs only when the C terminus of arrestin is released upon the activation of the arrestin. Um, I, I cannot say that it's only after, but it's most likely occur after the uh, C terminus release of, of the arrestin after activation. So now I want to move on to how arrestin interact with ARC protein. So when we incubated ARC2 with beta state arrestin, we could not detect any HDX changes before and after the co-incubation. So again, we tried to uh, analyze if that interaction would occur if the arrestin is activated. So again, we made C-terminal truncated arrestin and co-incubated this pre-active arrestin with, uh, with ARC2. And we compared the HDX profile before and after co-incubation. And we have got this uh, HDX profile changes. Again, blue colored regions should reduce HDX upon co-incubation. Uh, and as you see here, the uh, HDX profile change in the arrestin is quite different from what we observed from uh, junk arrestin co-incubation. And, and here we have um, these regions should be reduced HDX upon co-incubation with arrestin. So again, to identify the specific binding site between these two proteins, we generated a fluorescence labeled arrestin construct and three to find switched ARC2 construct uh, uh, choosing specific residues based on the HDX MS result. So we choose a uh, 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 residue 300 near the gate loop to fluorescence labeling, and also uh, residue three, 357 for the another fluorescence labeling. We also switched several regions within the uh, within ARC 
to switch these regions to treat fun. So when we co-incubated uh, orestin, which has a fluorescence labeling as 300, and, and these ERK mutation with mutant construct, we have we, we could detect decrease of the fluorescence only uh, in, in with the ERK that has tryptophan at 47 or 64 and, and slightly on the two, uh, 125. But when, when we coincubated arresting that has fluorescence at 375, the, the, this fluorescence intensity was decreased when it is co-incubated with ARC that has tryptophan either in 113, 125, or 228 to 233, and um, 267. So these results suggest that the gate loop has closely located to the end loop, while the interdomain loop two is closely located to C loop. We also want to note that the interdomain loop two becomes more exposed and, and ready to interact with other proteins when the c -tail is released in the active state of arrestin. So here is the model that the uh, c -tail released active arrestin interact with ARC2 in two, having two binding interfaces either the gate loop and, and the interdomain loop too. So uh, finally, if we want to compare the arrestin junk interaction mode and arrestin arc interaction mode, you will you see that there are differences. So today I cannot tell you the specific residues that are involved in the binding. However, if we have more research, more research to do and if we can define the specific binding residues between arresting junk and arresting arc, then then I think that we can uh, uh, we can uh, develop a, a regulator that selectively uh, modulate the arresting mediated junk activation or arresting mediated arc activation. So with that, I would like to thank uh, thank the audience. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Jim Pengson from Sandong University, who did the fluorescence sequencing uh, experiment. And I would like to thank my lab members, especially uh, Dr. Jiang Bak and Minu Yun, who did most of these works, and uh, Dong Ham and Gie Gin for their assistance. Uh, thank you. And I would like to take any questions from now. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ka, Ka Young. I can read out um, a couple of questions to you. If there's any other questions we don't get to, um, I guess, Ka Young, if you could just type the answers off, off, you know, offline in the, in the next, during the next talk or at the end. But for okay. now, um, Deep uh, Chatterjee has two questions and I think we have time for those. So the first question is, other arrestin forms dimers, does arrestin 2, it, uh, is it also dynamic, di dimeric in nature, which may interfere with your binding experiment? Um, um, so is arrestin 2 also dy dimeric? And does, could that form, an, could that interfere with your binding experiment? So it, it could be, um, Arrestin 2 usually is in monomer in, in our experimental system, but in the cellular context, it can form a dimer in a specific occasion. And if that's happening, then it will, it may interfere with the, bi with the binding of, of the junk or ARC uh, in, in the cell. Yeah. But, but in our experimental system, it was a monomeric arrestin. Okay, okay, interesting. This, this, this dimerization issue in, uh, is, is a vexing issue in, in this area. Um, Deep also asks, do you have any plans to prepare constitutively active arrestin mutants? Um, so I, actually, I don't, um, 
this, so I don't understand what's the constitutively active arresting mutant that deep asked because uh, in, in, I think in arresting field, the construct that I used is the one that usually people use to mimic the active state of arresting. So if, we, if you can specify the question again, then I can answer it better. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe Jeep offline because we probably have to move on because this is a quick, sharp, snappy webinar session. Uh, if you could just rephrase that question in the Q and A, and Carl Young can answer in in sure. detail offline. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Look, we might um, move on. Rafaro, I know you've got some questions. I, I guess uh, Carl Young can do her best to answer those. Um, uh, uh, later. So thank you for your patience in that matter. So I would now like to uh, introduce um, uh, Dr. Arun. Uh, and so thank you very much, Arun. Uh, brilliant. Now, I'd love to introduce um, Asuka uh, Inoue. So he's from uh, Tohoku University in Japan. And he's an associate professor at the Graduate School of Pharmaceutical Sciences there. His research interests are to understand the molecular basis of GPCR signal selectivity and to contribute to the development of new drugs targeting GPCRs. And so I would very much like to introduce him to give us a talk on bias ligands and GERC subtype selectivity, negative regulations of GERC 5.6 by GQ and its consequence for beta arrestin functionality. Uh, thank you, Asuka. I, oh, sorry, you're on mute. Uh, I'll see if I can unmute you. I don't know if I can. Yes. Hello? So, can, can you hear me well? Yes, yes, loud and clear. Yeah, I just uh, saw uh, like a warning. Uh, but it's okay. So my uh, my presentation uh, today is about G protein versus uh, beta restin uh, signaling. In this uh, simplified scheme, uh, we see a sequential uh, signaling event upon uh, GPCR stimulation. Uh, ligand bound uh, G protein, G GPCR first engage uh, G protein uh, to trigger it's chemical signaling, and then recruit uh, beta resin to shut down uh, G protein signaling or uh, initiate another pathway. Although uh, these two pathways are initiated by the same receptor, it has been known that these are uh, pharmacologically separatable. Uh, this such property of uh, ligand is called bias and ha has a beneficial uh, effect because of potentially attenuated uh, adverse effect while keeping a therapeutic effect. For example, in angiotensin II receptor 81R, uh, GK activation uh, increases uh, blood, blood pressure but beta resin pathway protects cardio function. In new opioid receptor, opiates exert a therapeutic pain relief effect uh, through GI pathway while causing uh, many opioid uh, side effects via beta resin uh, pathway. Accordingly, uh, arresting bias for AT1R or uh, G protein in bias for MOR are regarded as a preferred uh, drug. Uh, indeed, uh, such uh, drug, polycerizine, was approved by FDA last year. Uh, naively, we assume that uh, signaling bias is achieved by different receptor confirmation, each of which is uh, preferentially recognized by distinct effectors. Indeed, there are a number of uh, structure, structure studies uh, to support this notion. 
on the left, an extensive mutagenesis study by uh, Utten and Sexton groups demonstrated that uh, arestin biased uh, ligand engages the GLP-1 receptor via the upper part of the receptor and trigger arestin signaling through a distinct activation path uh, from that of a balanced ligand GLP-1 itself. On the right, uh, spectroscopic uh, study by Lefkowitz and co-workers show that uh, transmembrane opening uh, in the intracellular side is different between uh, arresting biased and GQ biased ligand. While we appreciate the crucial role of receptor uh, confession in determining uh, effector selectivity, we wondered there might be additional layer of complexity at the level of uh, cell system. And specifically, we assumed that besides receptor confirmation, uh, signaling bias is indirectly regulated in a sing signal transduction manner. In addition, we questioned whether uh, G protein and beta resting are separatable or interdependent. We focus on GPCR kinase. GRKs are the main kinases that phosphorylate uh, principally receptors C-terminal tail. And this is a critical modification to allow uh, beta resin binding. Another important aspect of GP cell signaling and bias is that both G protein and beta resting induces diverse <coughs> signaling. Bias ligand <coughs> change not only a balance between G protein and beta resting signaling, but also affect a signaling profile within each class. I should comment that signaling diversity in G protein and arestin <coughs> arise from different mechanisms. G proteins consist of many members and show clear on or off state. In contrast, there are only two subtypes in beta arestin, yet they can adapt uh, multiple active confirmations. In other words, diversity in G protein signaling is regarded as uh, GPCR bias, and that of arresting is seen as transducer bias. Importantly, uh, variable confirmations are attributable to phosphorylation codes, uh, which are supposed provided by activation of specific GRK subtypes. Based on uh, this regulatory mechanism, we hypothesized that GLKs are involved in functional selectivity of <coughs> bias ligand. In particular, we assumed that signaling bias is composed of uh, se sequential events starting from initial uh, G protein bias affecting GRK selectivity and causing beta resting transducer bias. In the following study, we focused on the four major ubiquitously expressed GRK subtypes called GRK2356. <clears throat> we used angiotensin 2 receptor 81R as a model. As I briefly explained in my previous slide, uh, GQ signaling causes uh, hypertension and IST activation has a protective effect. It also blocks uh, <coughs> arresting function, thereby causing, sorry, this one, cardiotoxicity. An improved ALB has been proposed by Defcoids and coworkers. It has dual GQ blocking and arresting stimulatory effect. And this is expected to show beneficial action as compared with a classical ALB. I should also comment that a peptide called TRV 
0.027 was developed by Tribina company and has a substantial GI and G12 activity, although uh, GQ activity is much weakened. This is what we discovered in terms of GRK selectivity and arsine confirmation. In essence, GQ is a switch deciding GRK56 mediated or GRK23 mediated phosphorylation. GQ inhibition by a small molecule named uh, YM can shift angiotensin 2's uh, GRK selectivity from uh, 2356 to 56 only. In both cases, uh, resin adopt a different conformation from angiotensin 2, uh, which is called tail hanging conformation. Importantly, uh, in the YM treated condition, 81R is bound to angiotensin 2 and should have the same uh, active receptor confirmation as a YM minus condition. Yet, uh, it's recognized by uh, arresting uh, differently. Uh, this project is spearheaded by Koki Kawakami, uh, who is very talented and hard worker student in my laboratory. When we looked at arresting recruitment using a nanobit uh, based protein proximity assay, uh, there's a drastic change between the two ligands. In the parental HEC2 3 cell, arresting recruitment speed is uh, slow in the TRV compound. And the same experiment is done in uh, GLK knockout cell, we see that angiotensin 2 mainly uses GLK23 for perarestin recruitment. TRV induced arrestin recruitment is totally dependent on GLK5 and 6. Intriguingly, when we use a GQ inhibitor, YM, in the angiotensin 2 treated cell. Now, angiotensin 2 behaves much like, if not identical, to the TRV ligand in terms of GLK selectivity. Again, in the YM plus condition, arresting recruitment kinetics is slow in the parental cell as compared with YM minus condition. In the GRK23 knockout, arresting recruitment is slightly increased as compared to its Y minus condition. And in the GRK56 knockout, recruitment signal is attenuated. These results show that GRK selectivity occur not only in a receptor structure dependent manner, but also in a G protein signaling dependent manner. We extended the nanobit analysis further, and shown here is a selection of um, our assays. On the right, angiotensin 2 induced responses such as GQ dissociation, receptor internalization, and arresting equipment to the receptor in the GRK knockout cell line, as well as arresting confirmation sensor and arc binding are monitored. On the left, uh, TRB in, uh, induced response are shown in the symmetry. Notable differences include a lack of receptor interlaces shown in the GRK56 knockout cell, insensitivity to finger loop region transcation, uh, absence of arc binding and weak arresting confirmation of change recognized by the interbody sensors. These results show that TRV stimulated arresting 
is capable of receptor interaction, but receptor engagement mode and signaling activity are different from angiotensin two induced RSG. This is a short summary of the first part. We found that the resin bias diagram uh, preferentially uses GRK56 to recruit beta resin. In contrast, a reference diagram, angiotensin 2, shows a preference toward uh, GRK2 and 3. Interestingly, GQ inhibitor treatment changes GRK preference from 2,3 to 5,6, suggesting that a bias is determined not only by not only by a receptor structure itself, but also by a signaling context. As a consequence, beta-S in binding mode and confirmation, as well as uh, functions, are different between the two ligands. This indicates that arresting bias ligand may not recapitulate arresting function observed in uh, balanced ligand situation. We then asked which residue is preferentially phosphorylated by GRK5 and 6. In the site, Zolic side of 81R, there are 11 serine and threonine residue, and two phosphorylation codes are found. We first attempted to detect phosphorylation uh, by mass spec, but without a success. We then tried uh, alanine scanning within the uh, two phosphorylation code and measured arresting recruitment response by the two ligands. Among the seven uh, single alanine mutants, we found that S326 the most uh, proximal position to the TM core uh, was most severely affected by TRB induced arresting equipment. Thus, we speculate uh, this position is likely phosphorylated by GRK5 and 6 upon uh, bias ligand stimulation. Interestingly, there's a recent GRK structure study by Benovic and co workers. They found that GRK uses its N terminal hakes to sense a hydrophobic surface of an interacting uh, carmogenin protein. They discussed that the same machinery uh, works when GRK5 recognized agonist bound open uh, GPCR. We imagine that once GRK5 senses the hydrophobic receptor core, it starts to phosphorate. Uh, nearby uh, saying threonine residues. And how does GQ regulate GRK5 and 6 activity? We hypothesized that this regulation involves uh, physical interaction between uh, GQ and GRK5 and 6 rather than controlled by uh, downstream GQ signaling. <clears throat> to do so, we uh, monitored uh, GLK and GQ heterotrimer, uh, in addition to uh, GLK and receptor interaction. In the upper part of the experiment, we fused uh, one nanobit fragment to receptor and the other fragment to GLK and monitored uh, receptor GLK interaction. In the lower part of the experiment, we fused uh, one fragment to GRK and the other fragment to G beta and expressed uh, heterotrimer. In both cases, we see robust decreased signal upon angiotensin II stimulation. In contrast, these interactions were rather increased upon TRB stimulation or angiotensin II plus YM co treatment. Thus, GQ activation seems to repel GRK56 from 81 GQ signaling complex. Uh, 
finally, we performed uh, dual color single uh, molecule microscopy uh, to examine behavior and localization of AT1 and GRK5. Uh, in our setting, uh, we can simultaneously, simultaneously track both GRK5 and AT1R molecules on the surface of uh, receptor. Uh, this experiment was done by a collaborator, Masataka Yanagawa, at Wiki Institute in Japan. Uh, this is a movie file that shows behavior of receptor and GRK5 molecule in real time. We see that molecules are moving around and slows down upon uh, ligand stimulation regardless of ligand type. We also notice that uh, intense apparent cluster signals are observed, especially in the TRV and YM conditions, but not much so in angiotensin II uh, condition. Similarly, when we uh, track these molecule and calculate uh, on rate or collision frequency, we see uh, decreased level upon uh, YM stimulation, but not the other. We also noticed that co-calculation uh, lifetime is prolonged upon TRB or YM conditions but not much so by angiotensin II stimulation. This is a summary of the second part. We found that JRK5 and 6 is present in close uh, proximity of uh, GQ. And <clears throat> this occurs spontaneously without ligand stimulation. Upon ligand stimulation, both AT1R and JRK56 and GQ uh, move to immobile hotspot. We speculate uh, that this is probably the site where uh, these three molecules are efficiently assembled. Angiotensin II stimulation triggers activation of GQ and induces displacement of the complex. Thus, uh, before Receptor is fully phosphorylated by GRK5 and 6. Uh, 5 and 6 leaves uh, from AT1R and allows GRK2 and 6, uh, 2 and 3 to engage the receptor. On contrary, the GQ inhibited condition, GRK5 uh, recognizes receptor bound AT1 structure and continuously phosphorylates the receptor. Conceptually, our findings brings a new aspect of uh, bias mechanism. As I mentioned at the beginning, a common idea is that bias ligands shift uh, receptor conformations, and each conformation is preferentially recognized by different effectors. Uh, this is how signaling bias is produced. However, in our model, uh, there's another layer of bias degradation the conformational shift um, first affect uh, GQ, and this GQ level determine, determines GRK selectivity, which defines uh, oscillation pattern, and finally result in arresting function. Further, our uh, data suggests that there's a close relationship between GQ activity and arresting act action. And at least in AT1R, we argue that uh, GQ silent beta resting bias ligands shall differ in beta resting function from that of uh, balanced ligand. Finally, I'd like to thank my members of my lab at Tohoku University, especially uh, Koki Kawakami, who developed and performed the nanobit signaling assays along with Suzune san and Misaki san. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Yanagawa at uh, Sako Laboratory in Niken for his 
uh, sophisticated single molecule imaging experiment. Finally, uh, interbody uh, confirmation sensor uh, is from Arang and has been useful for, to study arresting behavior in cell. And thank you very much. So thank you very much, Aska. Uh, very, very interesting talk. The floor is now open for questions. Uh, we can have some from the audience or from other panelists. Uh, please feel free. Um, can, can I ask a question? So, Asuka, it was a very nice talk. And I'm so glad to see how you developed the story because I have been listening about this story about two years, right? And, and I was so excited to hear how you developed the full story and, and, and excited to be a part of the story in the future. So I, I have a question about the GQ inhibitor. So when you treat the cell with the GQ inhibitor that you used in, in this study, does it keep the GQ in the heterotrimer or it just, um, what's the mechanism of that inhibitor? So the GQ inhibitor called YM, it's basically a nucleotide exchange blocker. So usually the G protein exists in the GDP bound state. And in this state, uh, uh, when we treat cell with YM, uh, GQ cannot uh, dissociate uh, GDP and thereby keeping uh, G GQ inactive state. But in a GDP free state, uh, so this is not a, like an artificial state, uh, you can study in, in vitro, but if you treat um, this protein is YM, then uh, nucleotide uh, cannot get in. Uh, do I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So do you expect that the GQ interact with GRK5 or 6 in its heterotrimer with GDP bound binding on it? So your question is uh, in which state um, GRK5 can engage uh, GQ? So the, is it like the, a G, GDP free or GDP bound or even GDP? GDP bound. So we assume it's GDP bound form, inactive uh, form. But uh, this is that uh, my impression, not uh, we do not have a, a good experiment to support that. And I think your experiment uh, technique will uh, solve the issue. Sure. Okay, thank, thank you so much. So we have, we have two questions from the audience. The first one I think relates to what Carl just asked, but I'll ask it because it's got an extra bit to it. Uh, beautiful talk and exciting data, Aska. This is from Aileen Hanyeloglu. Han I hope I said that okay. If I got this right, the GQ heterotrimer may be scaffolding G56. How do you think this might occur? Lipids, question mark. Also any suggestion of receptor GERC5 hotspots as reported for the GPCRG protein? Yeah, this is really a good question. So I think the first one is related to Kayan's uh, one. We think uh, the scaffold uh, G protein is the heterotrimer, inactive G, uh, heterotrimer. Uh, but again, so we do not have uh, like a bi biochemical evidence. And yeah. like the second one or the third one is, uh, I, I think the third one is important. So as you know, so there's a, a nice paper by, uh, by sorry, the, I, I forgot the name, uh, Caribbean group showing the uh, hotspot uh, receptor and G protein accumulated. And we think uh, the 81R molecule and GRK5 molecule uh, accumulated in the very similar uh, 
in mobile hotspot. Uh, but again, so we cannot, we haven't compared side by side um, measuring G protein uh, receptor GLCA imaging and our GLK5 and receptor GLCA imaging. But okay. uh, I think, uh, yes. Hmm. We, we've got two more questions from the audience. Then we might just move on to the concluding panel, general open panel discussion. So from Nicholas Smith, uh, thanks, Asuka, beautiful work. Are there different phosphorylation sites for each of the GERCs on the 81RC terminus? Is there a way to look at the kinetics of interaction with the tail to follow up on the kinetics hypothesis? So the question is, so I think this relates to this part. <laughs> So although we narrow down uh, GLK5 mediated phosphorylation to the, uh, the very proximal uh, position, uh, three, to three to six, uh, same. Uh, but I, we have not yet, for example, determined um, GLK23 uh, phosphorylation sites, for example. And okay. uh, do I, I, I think I have on partially answered Nicola's questions. Okay. Uh, it, and you, yeah, you can look, you can always, yeah. Ex, yeah, sorry, I was going to say you could always type in more detail yeah. if, if you wanted to. Um, uh, there are some more questions. So um, I guess, Christina, if you're happy for me to keep. Uh, uh, reading out the questions, I will I will do so because this could be part of the panel discussion as well. So from uh, JSEC, amazing talk. Can you speculate if the same mechanism of beta arrest and regulation through modulation of GERC's activity by G protein alpha Q11 can be seen for other subunits? So is this... Um... Other subunit means like um, G alpha subunits? I, I guess I, you could always try, Jacek, you could um, you could always try answering that offline if you want me to move on to the next one and Jacek can, can qualify, ask the question in more detail if you like. Yeah, so <clears throat> if I take the other subunit as a, like other G alpha subunit. Um, so we, um, for example, we um, performed beta resting recruitment experiment in a panel of G protein knockout cell. And we only see uh, this effect in the GQ11 knockout cell, but not. Um, uh, GI or G1213 or GS knockout cell, uh, the arresting behavior uh, was identical to parental cell. So that means um, 81R and also, so actually GS experiment is done by a beta 2 error. So GLK56 regulation by G protein uh, is, we think, specific to GQ11 uh, subfamily. Okay, and finally, um, Sean So says, Hi, Asuka, Asuka, very cool talk. Do you think this heterotrimeric GQ plus GERC56 scaffolding is unique to the angiotensin receptor? What is known about the phosphorylation patterns of GERC56? Does it predominantly phosphorylate C tails of the receptor? Yeah, that's an important question. We think. Uh, well, we have ex evidence that um, uh, this mechanism uh, is applicable to other GQ coupled receptor. So for example, uh, serotonin um, receptor, serotonin uh, 5-2A receptor and neurotensin uh, receptor, both uh, that they are both uh, primary coupled GQ. And we find that um, when we broke uh, GQ, um, 
GRK uh, dependency uh, does dramatically change. And this is uh, quite much similar to uh, angiotensin receptor. And second uh, part is like um, uh, the position of oscillation. I think uh, dependent uh, on the, the uh, serine and serine residue, uh, it's been, it's known that JRK5 and 6 can phosphorylate, for example, ICL3. And some of the receptor has a large um, intracellular uh, loop. But in this uh, 81 receptor, uh, serine and serine are not present in this uh, ICL loop. And that's a uh, kind of specific case. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you, all the speakers. Um, I think we are, we are basically winding up now. There's, uh, the, the floor is open for any final comments by uh, the audience or questions for all speakers. Uh, and I'll give you a, a couple of minutes. And if, if not, I guess I will, I'll hand over to Christina or Claudia or Ursula or Alad to find out, or Cheryl, <laughs> uh, what we do next. Are we, do you formally close proceedings, Christina? Or do we have a quick discussion? So thank you very much. I think that we are we are past the time of the webinar. So one or two concluding remarks, but then I think that we need to to close the session and of course thank all the all the speakers and, and the moderator for today. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to close proceedings and uh, thank thanks again to all the speakers. Thank you very much to the the questions. That's what makes this a open discussion, and we all we all learn by it. Uh, thank you to the Target 2035 organizers. This is a great initiative. It's really appreciate a, a, a slot for the Asia Pacific time zone. Uh, and hopefully we get to do this again uh, when you've finished circulating the world and come back to us. So thank you everyone and have a good evening or have a, have a good, uh, good morning.